Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Re-Energizing Value-Based Care, the strategies physicians and health systems need to succeed. I'm Gabrielle Mason with Becker's Hospital Review. We'll begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. We're so looking forward to hearing your questions. Today's session is being recorded and it will be available after the event. You can use the same link that you use to log into today's webinar to access the recording. At this time, I'm so pleased to introduce our speakers, Stephen Liu, MD. He's the founder and chief medical officer of Ingenious Med and a practicing intensivist at Scripps Healthcare in San Diego. Dr. Liu is a senior fellow of the Society of Hospital medicine and has been recognized as one of the nation's top hospitalists by the, the American College of Physicians. Ingenious Med is a healthcare IT solution that optimizes physician productivity and hospital performance at the point of care. Since 1999, the solution has facilitated more than 150 million encounters across 70% of the nation's largest health systems and physician management groups. Today, we also have wrote D. Upal, MD, the Chief Clinical Officer of Hospital Services for Team Health. Team Health is a physician-led, patient-focused company. With over 16,000 clinicians, Team Health offers the highest quality staffing, administrative support, and management across the full continuum of care, from hospital-based practices to post-acute care and ambulatory centers. Dr. Upol holds more than 17 years of clinical and leadership experience and leads the clinical and operational aspects of the hospital medicine service line, as well as orthopedics, general surgery, and obstetric specialty service lines. Dr. Upol received a Bachelor of Science in Health Sciences from the University of Nevada, Reno, a medical degree from Ohio State University College of Medicine and Public Health, and a Master of Business Administration from Cleveland State University. It's now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Dr. Stephen Liu to begin today's presentation. Great. Actually, it's going to be Rohit um, uh, who's going to go over the next slide. So, uh, uh, but you know, I'll, actually, let me let me let me start the intro. So, <laughs> thanks for having us uh, uh, and joining your day. I know we moved the presentation about a week ago. Um, uh, and our focus is re-energizing value-based care and focusing on some tools and strategies that uh, either physician groups or health systems can think about as you take your value-based journey wherever it might be. So with that, I will now throw it to Rohit um, to go over a little bit about Team Health. Perfect. Thanks, Steve. Um, and, and thank you for the opportunity to present with you. A uh, very exciting topic. So just a little bit about Team Health, as was mentioned, Team Health is a physician-led company. We've grown from emergency medicine uh, over 40 years ago to become the largest integrated care providers in the country. And at Team Health, I had the pleasure of working with leaders who have great vision and heart. We are incredibly passionate about our commitment to the quality and safety of the care we deliver to patients, to creating the best possible experience experience for our clinicians. And as you can see here, we provide excellent care across the full continuum, everything from hospital-based hospital -based services to post-acute, ambulatory, and virtual care. Great, and so um, uh, one intro slide on our company, and I'll go over this pretty quickly and we can get into sort of the didactic section so for folks who don't know Ingenious Med, it's a point of care platform that the physicians use. Um, really, uh, uh, we, we leverage it to align the physicians on whatever the health system or the practice cares about performance wise. And it really focuses on a couple different areas. Uh, revenue, you know, either fee for service or if you've moved to value-based care, kind of work capture and attribution and so forth. Um, a bunch of practice analytics to help you uh, manage the physicians and, and you know, uh, measure performance. And then we leverage the platform to get the physicians to kind of focus on uh, cost reduction, efficiency, quality, you know, reducing bed days, readmissions. And then there's a bunch of automation tools 
And as um, um, uh, we said in the beginning, we've got a decent footprint. Um, 70% of the largest uh, physician groups and, and health systems um, uh, use our platform. And I think the, the one stat that I, I get excited about it as, as a founder is a stat that um, one out of every five hospitalized patients, or, or said another way, 20% of hospital discharges go through our platform. And if you think about it, those are the sickest, you know, uh, highest risk, you know, highest utilizers. Um, and that's really the focus of value-based care is kind of helping those folks to be kind of healthy and, and uh, a little less costly and high quality. So with that, let's uh, go into uh, the presentation. So we're going to start with an industry perspective, a little bit more didactic, but um, it's been hard to move the needle on value-based care. You know, if I look back, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, I thought we'd be way more uh, ahead of the game and, and, and really way more knee-deep uh, than I think, you know, Rohit and I have seen these days. It's It's been slow going. Um, maybe, maybe you know, for folks who've been in the industry for 40 years, they wouldn't be surprised. Now I'm not surprised, but um, it has been slow going. We have made some progress with value-based care but there have definitely been some stumbling blocks. And so with that, a couple slides. So, so first of all, it's pretty clear that fee for service still prevails. It's, it's ubiquitous. It's, it's the dominant kind of reimbursement program. Um, the CHIME survey recently basically showed and, and, and you know, confirmed healthcare organizations, most of their fee for, most of their reimbursements are fee for service. Uh, if you look at 2021, last year, 76% higher than prior years. And there are reasons for that. COVID obviously played a big role, loss of focus, limited resources, kind of slowed down alternative payment models. Um, you know, and then there were some government mandates that, that, you know, had folks having to scramble to make sure, you know, you didn't have surprise billing and transparency of price and just a little bit of loss of focus there. And if you look on the right-hand side, the HC plan um, for last year, showed, you know, there was some growth with APMs, um, and you can see you know, BPCI and shared savings, ACO type things were, were pops, but I think what I found is the most interesting was that bottom part there where it showed that the top three challenges for alternative payment models uh, was providers just weren't ready or willing to take on any financial risk. Um, to they just couldn't operationalize it. Their infrastructure wasn't there. Or three, they just they just weren't interested. Um, they just weren't ready. Um, maybe on the flip side, and as a positive note, I think for folks who have taken on and maybe folks on this webinar, you know, the the alternative payment model portion of your portfolio probably did buoy some of your revenues when fee for service just disappeared during COVID. So that's the good news of it. And I know from an ingenious med standpoint, we see with our clients and, and prospects, there are groups who are absolutely moving forward, jumping both feet in, putting in the strategic uh, investments into the organizations uh, to, to do value-based care, even though as of 2021 or 2022, not $1 is coming from value-based contracts. Um, it's an investment, but um, it is slowly but surely happening. So uh, another, um, you know, challenge is, is that physicians are very much so paid uh, primarily on volume. So the RAND study showed that 80, 90% of physicians heavily volume based um, and uh, you know in terms of quality or cost incentives uh, are less than 10 percent so it's it is challenging and this is uh, in a way sort of a, um, a secondary uh, um, um, leader on, on on where volume is but it is hard to incent positions on quality and actually I, I know I'm supposed to be um, educating at this point but I actually want to ask Rohit um, like, what are your what are your thoughts? And Team Health does a great job of incenting the physicians, but you know, it is hard to to move from just straight out work RVUs and uh, God forbid some groups are out you know straight out salaried uh, you know physicians as well. But how how have you guys navigated kind of adding some incentives on value? 
Yeah, Steve. So I'm sure we're going to talk more about incentives, and there's a lot to say on that. Um, but I think there's got to be balance. And you know, for for us, even though uh, a majority of the, the revenue that we receive comes through uh, volume, the way we in, incentivize our clinicians is 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 in the range of 10 to 30 percent on volume. And, and really, for us, a sweet that, that's kind of the sweet spot. So. We still want the majority of, of pay to come from other incentives outside of your volume. Oh, wow. That, I, I didn't know you guys were that heavily focused on it. That's actually wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I know from our standpoint, in my, in my own group and, and, you know, other clients out there, I think one of the challenges is when you move to value incentives, sometimes it's on things that, that physicians can't impact. I'm going to get granular here, but a great example is like, you know, the – you know, for hospitalists, for example, it's like discharging patients, uh, uh, you know, aggressively when it's ready. Um, and we've had some folks, you know, hey, it's not on when the patient discharged. You know, I can write the order. Um, that's what I can control. But when that patient leaves, I can't. And so I think that's one one hint for folks is make sure it is on something that they can actually truly impact. So here over at Scripps, they're, they're incented on when the orders were placed. And the rest is more operational stuff on the hospital side. Um, we have we have some groups who will actually um, capture, I guess maybe fake work RVUs for value-based things like doing an extra phone call or a meeting with a family. You don't get paid on that stuff, but those are preventative, and so you can capture that value-based work, and, and some folks will kind of incent on that. Okay. Well, um, uh, n the next um, item here is just BPCI. So BPCI – um, has been a little challenging. It's a great program, but it, it hasn't moved the dial as much as um, I think we all thought it would. Um, so it launched about three years ago, and uh, a recent study looking at the first year payments, honestly, it really only fall, uh, found very small reductions in Medicare payments when you compared the participating um, organizations with control and no change within readmissions, mortality, volume, and case mix. And so a little disappointing, um, but I will say this, that was only first-year payments, and as programs mature and, you know, gain more experience, I would expect that, um, you know, that uh, would change sort of the impact of sort of the benefits. Um, I, I know for sure, at least in the acute and subacute space, uh, a lot of patients are appropriate, uh, but, you know, in 60, 80 percent of them might have appropriate length of stays and whatnot, but there is definite fat. There is definite efficiency that can be gained. So with that, uh, ACOs. So ACOs uh, also uh, a little bit of a tricky uh, 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 result as well, some mixed success. It's interesting, but if you look at the left-hand side, you can see the growth since inception. And then 2021, 2020, COVID hit and things plateaued, CMS hit the pause button on new ACOs, and, and some dropouts happen, you know, some risk, uh, you know, downside risk requirements and so forth. Um, things are back on the rise. And uh, if you look at the right-hand side, what's interesting is um, there was a study a, a few years back kind of looking at sort of the results. And uh, back then, it, it was a little bit mixed. I mean, 44% of the orgs showed no savings. And then 31% actually did well enough um, uh, and actually got some reimbursements, some shared savings. And then uh, tw a quarter, 25% actually had savings, but it wasn't significant enough to get anything out of it. So, you know, n not ideal. Um, I will say from 2017 and on, actually net savings, uh, you know, over uh, losses actually finally kind of switched and the tipping point happened and, and things became positive. And you can see almost like a doubling year over year of just increased net savings. And so um, it did plateau a little bit with COVID, but uh, numbers should look a lot better uh, more recently. And then finally, um, we'll finish this up with Medicare Advantage. And Medicare Advantage has been strong. You can see the growth there and, and some really nice numbers, about 10% uh, tax, uh, taxpayer savings per uh, member or enrollee and really nice reduction in avoidable hospitalizations uh, for high MCCs. 
And uh, I know that there's very good high uh, satisfaction by the members and there's great uh, impact on sort of like out of pocket costs for the members, about $1,600 per, uh, per patient. So some nice numbers there. And to round everything out, so, so it's been mixed in terms of, uh, you know, APMs and their rollouts and whatnot over the past couple of years. And COVID played a big role in just disrupting everything and, and, you know, maybe slowing a lot of things down. I would also say it helped in many ways too. And so if you think about it this way, um, looking out three years ago as opposed to today, you know, COVID absolutely accelerated this playbook of things that you need to do if you want to take on value-based payments. So, you know, Virtual care, telemedicine, remote patient monitoring, those were not really present before. Um, you know, the shift towards uh, managing patients in lower cost settings, you know, hospital at home, home care visits, et cetera, um, it's taken on a life of its own, you know. Um, reduced utilization. Uh, there was a point where <laughs> there was like no utilization. It's probably swinging the other way, um, but that was helpful. And then one really interesting thing is. I think for all the healthcare providers, you know, health systems, uh, physician groups, um, facilities, sites, it, we, we were in the trenches, in the battle zone, just trying to survive and deal with COVID, and it fostered collaboration and relationships and communication, and you had to kind of figure out, you know, um, how folks could kind of just you know, work together kind of to deal with the COVID surges. But I think that'll go forward because now you can start thinking about narrowing the network and developing relationships to unload the hospital and so forth. Tools for tracking and outreach for patients and so forth. And then behavioral health, mental health became, you know, way much bigger of a, of a focus, which you all, you need all of those pieces. So it's all kind of come together and it's sort of a perfect storm for organizations to kind of really kind of think about getting their organizations ready for strategic, um, uh, for value-based care. So with that, uh, we have our first poll question for the audience. Um, and so- before, uh, before you jump into that, um, real quick, there was a couple of comments in the chat. I just wanted to make sure we address. So, so the last one I see was around um, bundle payments and whether they would become mandatory in 2024, which was the last announcement from CMMI was once BPCI advance expires at the end of 2023, that there will be the rollout of new mandatory bundles. Um, and I haven't heard, I haven't seen any updates since then. I have another. Roy, do we get any other questions? Sorry about Steve, there was one more question on the study with the BPCIA. Was there any accounting for the fact that CMS took a 3% reduction first? I think that was back on the, some of the, the studies that you shared. Yeah, let me see. I see this was back on the one slide. here, the BPCI one. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this was... Uh, I want to say this was gross, um, so not factoring in the the CMS cut of it, but I'm not 100% sure. Good question. Okay, we follow up on that one. Mm -hmm. We can follow up. Yep. Okay. Uh, well, and and keep keep the questions coming. This is definitely interactive with the audience. Um, all right. So our first poll question is. For, for your organization, health system, practice, or whatnot, what kind of traction will you um, see from a, uh, an increase in value-based reimbursements over the next few years? So we'll give about 30, 40 seconds um, if you could uh, uh, vote on, hey, it's going to grow. I mean, it's not going to grow. It might even shrink. We're going to draw back a little bit. Um, or there'll be some, but it's going to be slow, uh, moderate growth, or man, we are barreling. It's going to be significant over the next three years. So go ahead and vote, folks, and we'll show you the results. So, Steve, on, on my screen, it did not launch. Uh, the poll. Oh, oh, sorry, but sorry. Yeah. I, you're right. That's all on me. I keep forgetting this uh, uh, platform. I need to do this. Okay, there you go. Now you can. Now you can vote. You have one second to vote. We can okay. see it.
Laura, I didn't start my timer. You think it's about time to see the results or give it a little bit? I'll give it just maybe 10 seconds more, let people finish up their voting, and mm -hmm. then we can go ahead and take a look. Okay, folks, finish up, and we'll click through and see the results in a second. Okay, it looks like it slowed down. So let's see the results. I'm curious myself. Oh, wow, look at that. Um, Mod moderate, some slow. Um, you know, if if I had asked this a year or so ago, I think it would have been no to slow. You know, it's uh, I, and I, I'm kind of seeing that in the market. So this goes with what I would expect. I'm row ahead. I'm curious. Does this surprise you or? No, that's I, I. This is what I would have expected as well. I think you said a year ago you would have seen slow or no growth, and but five years ago. I think most people would be in the moderate or rapid growth. So um, that kind of uh, goes along with some of the trends you described earlier. Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely reached sort of a, a not a fever pitch, but it's 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 the the ball is moving down the hill now. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, all right, well, congrats, everyone. It, it's funny because I I I remember like on like when I started I am there's like this thing about entrepreneurship. It was like you know congrats on entrepreneurship and sorry because like all of a sudden your life is going to be you know uh, sleepless nights and and headaches and all that and it's kind of like value based care. It's like big change is always hard, but it's worth it. Um, okay, so with that, uh, uh, Rohit, uh, you're going to give us a clinician leader's perspective. Yeah, so um, which I think is the most important perspective, but that's that's my bias. So uh, my, my first experience in value-based care was actually leading teams around 2012 and 2013. And at that time, the idea of bundle payments was actually gaining a lot of momentum. And there was a lot of enthusiasm around that transition that was occurring from volume to value, a lot of energy. And as a clinician and as a clinician leader, that was uh, super exciting. And, and I, even now, I often hear my uh, fellow physician leaders, we will find ourselves saying, hey, as long as we do the right thing for patients and we do the right thing for our clinicians, the, the rest of the, the business will take care of itself. And, and with BPCI and other value-based programs, the payment system's finally kind of aligning with our aspirations. Um, but I guess what I would say, unfortunately, um, 10 years later, we find ourselves still largely living in two different paradigms of fee-for-service and value-based care. And, and for most clinicians, as, as you showed earlier, Steve, the volume-driven model still, still dominates. So let me talk about my journey, um, which I think is probably a lot of people, this will resonate with them. Um, you know, as a hospitalist leader, you know, hospital medicine was the perfect specialty to tackle bundle payments because we were already the go-to change agents within hospitals. And um, for years as hospitalists, we ha have been working on improving quality and efficiency, at least within the four walls of the hospital, under a bundle payment known as the DRG. Um, so we were very familiar with that. Uh, when, I'm, when I joined Team Health uh, back in 2015, uh, we started participating in BPCI just after I joined the organization. Uh, and our footprint in the program was robust. And, and I remember the first year or two, it required such a big leadership lift uh, as we redesigned the way we deliver care and really transformed the mindset of our clinicians and, and many of our stakeholders. And, and we had a lot of success and we quickly generated significant savings in the program and, and you know, it was a win-win for everybody. We were really pleased with the many benefits of participating in BPCI Classic. Um, the focus on quality and patient outcomes resonated really well with our culture and the passions of our leaders. Our, our hospital medicine leaders were, are, are skilled and they were accustomed to improving the system of care within the four walls. 
and, and the opportunity to expand beyond the four walls really opened up tremendous opportunities for collaboration and system improvements that improve patient outcomes, but also improve the experience for our clinicians across the continuum. Because we would identify and address different barriers and inefficiencies um, that plagued our clinicians. One of the underappreciated aspects of BPCI is the degree to which it really placed physicians and physician leaders in the driver's seat, um, as opposed to the majority of the other value-based programs that are largely driven either you know, by payers or, or health systems. Um, and, and from my perspective, that physician engagement was a real key to our, our success. Um, and, and while we have a strong culture of collaboration, you know, BPCI opened the door to really deepening our integration of care across a lot of the silos um, as, as our hospitals leaders would partner with um, facility leaders and clinicians and SNFs and home health agencies, uh, reaching out to primary care physicians. Um, and then lastly, in the good column, uh, BPCI really created a mechanism and a return on investment for organizations to invest in additional resources to support patient care across the continuum. And so we were able to hire nurses and other staff to support care across those transitions. And, and that helped reduce administrative and clerical burdens on clinicians. So again, creating those win-wins. So th those are the, that was a good. Um, and then over time, as we transitioned from BPCI Classic to BPCI Advanced, uh, there were some challenges that developed. Um, so in the BPCI program, uh, if both physician and hospital are participating in the program, physicians trump the hospital. And so that you know created conflict uh, with a, a stakeholder we consider one of our uh, close partners. Um, so as more hospitals have become bundle initiators, that that conflict became more frequent uh, with our hospital partner. So, in these scenarios, we partner with our hospitals to support their BPCI programs. And of course, we can lend our expertise in that area. Um, as with any government program, there's, there's always gonna be some gaming the system. And, and that may be too harsh of a word, but uh, what I've seen over time is uh, savvy health systems you know, can focus less on care redesign and more on the actuarial exercise of you know, which bundles have the most advantageous target prices. Um, and even with that, you know, with the more challenging and less certain target prices with uh, under BPCI Advance, um, we've seen organizations be more selective with the number, number, the number of bundles they participate in, uh, which really shrinks um, the percentage of patients that are actually in, in a value-based program. For clinicians, uh, you know, that that small proportion of patients that are in BPCI, uh, again, they just make up such a small percentage of the total. And it's really challenging to keep track of patients. And, and you know, many clinicians just struggle with the concept or idea that we're going to deliver a different level of care uh, to these the small group of BPI, BPCI patients versus others. Um, so one of the things we try to do whenever we're engaged in care redesign is is we're careful to apply our processes to all patients and, and not just the BPCI patients. And then as one of the questions alluded to, uh, many of you are aware that the future of BPCI is unclear. Um, so for an organization of physician leaders uh, who, are always, who are visionary and always have a long-term focus, it's really challenging um, to know how to invest your time and energy and to take that time and energy from other areas to focus on a program, you know, that may not be, that may be sunsetting. Um, and then of course the last thing during the pa pandemic, there've been just so many clinical and operational challenges. Um, we've had to give our leaders and our clinicians uh, a break and, and give them bandwidth to deal with those challenges. Um, so oftentimes we just haven't had the luxury of diverting time and effort to anything other than caring for patients and supporting our clinicians uh, during a pandemic. Hey, Rohit, that, so uh, this was such a fascinating slide for me. Um, um, 
you know, a lot, a lot of what you do to be successful with BPCI, you're right. Like, I mean, some of it's actuarial stuff, but there is a lot of just stuff that we, you know, as physicians, you and I know this, but like, this is kind of what we became physicians for, right? You know, taking care of patients and doing sort of the right thing and whatnot. Um, when we were prepping for this webinar, I know in my, my research, there was a study, I mean, that just really clearly showed um, objectively that physician-led programs, um, I don't think it was BPCI focused, just alternative payment models, had uh, a much higher savings per, per patient or member, I guess. You know, and I looked at the details here, it's like $218 of savings uh, per, uh, per patient physician-led versus only 168 for a hospital led. So like a 30% difference, like market difference. Um, I, I guess I'm not at all surprised by that just because, you know, we're the ones making the sausage. We're so close to the value. But I'm curious, like what have you seen differently uh, from when team was kind of being the episode initiator for the physician group as opposed to collaborating with the hospital and them being the episode? Like, has anything changed uh, or is just more of the, the business of, of it? Well, I, I think your comments about physician leadership are very consistent with my experience. Um, you know, being an in initiator from a physician led organization, care redesign started from uh, engaging frontline clinicians and uh, getting them engaged and really helping them connect with their purpose, mm -hmm. understanding how this is making things better for patients, which is, you know, the most engaging thing for a physician, um, really drove uh, a culture around it, a change in mindset that went along with all the changes and processes. And, and that was huge for me. And I think oftentimes when you're not in a physician led setting, um, it's it's easier to start with other disciplines. Hey, case management can really drive this, right? And and you can certainly find opportunities through case management, and and you can have some success there. But physicians have so much influence on the decisions that patients make, or or we make those decisions uh, that have really big cost repercussions, right? And and if we're not teaching our physicians the cost and outcomes of those decisions, I, I think it, you're, you're leaving a lot of opportunity on the table. So that, that's, that's been my experience. Point. Yeah, well, you know, like uh, I used to say the physician's pen, but it, now it's like the physician's mouse click where it is like <laughs> the most powerful thing in healthcare, right? It's like dictates the yeah. quality of what happens, what gets ordered, what doesn't get ordered. Um, yeah, interesting. So it's a little bit of just alignment and being bought in and and all of that, but that it goes an extra mile if, they're, if, the, if the physicians are aligned. I mean, at, at the risk of um, uh, cutting into our time for the webinar, but I, I think this is fascinating. Um, why do you uh, like? In, it, why do you think it is that um, orgs may not involve the physicians as tightly? And is it just because it's easier to? get the case managers to do something and yeah I, I think it, it's probably more based on what kind of relationships exist within the health system and and who you think you can engage and leverage and unfortunately you know there's a lot of um, health systems where uh, the partnership between hospital administration and physician leadership may not have that foundation of trust you need to build off of because there's a lot of give and take as you start to you know look at care redesign um, there's some areas where you know people are going to have to work a little bit more or or have a, more vigilance um, and and you counter that with making their lives easier in other areas and then there are there's always an impact on the finances right so um, even within a value-based program like uh, bundle payments uh, you know, value or volume still has a big driver, right? So, um, and, and other financial pressures. So, for example, if, if we're partnering with a hospital, you know, if you're if you're working a bundle, keeping a patient in the hospital one extra day to avoid a SNF admission, you know, is a huge huge win, right? It's a huge win for for the patient. It's a it's a win for for the healthcare system, but 
the where the way the finance of the felt care right now that's a loss for the hospital and so we to you know when you're faced with those sort of forces to have alignment of physician leadership and healthcare leadership it really takes a pretty deep foundation of trust and you have to invest a lot of time to work through those issues to say hey how are we going to make sure that the way we design this is a win 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 um, you know it's a win for the clinicians it's a win for the facility patients get better care and and it's a win for the payer so yeah Actually, maybe maybe that's a, a takeaway. Like for for the folks on the webinar, physician groups. Like if you're if you're not having these conversations or you're not, you know, hearing about it, that could be a problem. Like you know, if you if if it, you're not in the discussions, you need to make sure that you are because this will be the model of the future, and you need to be participatory and, you know, thought as a as a partner. Um, or that could be an issue later. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, back to you, Rohit. Yeah, yeah, sure. And I know we spent a lot of time on BPCI, and that certainly comes from my bias as a hospitalist. But, you know, the bigger and maybe more durable transitions in the value-based care, as you showed in, in some of your data, are occurring within the growth of ACOs, um, and then especially in the growth of Medicare Advantage. And, and while these programs are framed around primary care for the m most part, some of their, well, absolutely their biggest drivers of cost continue to be ED visits, hospitalizations, readmissions, and post-acute care. And so that always brings uh, hospitalists into the equation. And so we have collaborations and partnerships with several ACOs and Medicare Advantage plans. And, and from a clinical, from a clinician perspective, these programs share many of the same features as BPCI, because um, you know, these entities are investing in additional human resources that can support clinicians in really taking care of patients across transitions. And, and within each of these, there's a major emphasis on quality. And, um, and so there's a particularly, uh, there's a particular focus on closing quality of care gaps and documenting clinical conditions that impact the risk adjustment models within those programs. And I did wanna to touch just briefly on direct contracting, which, which is the newest model. Um, and in this model, if you're not familiar with it, uh, direct contracting entities, essentially they form relationships mainly with primary care providers, and then they take risk on their Medicare fee-for-service patients. So it's kind of like bundle payments for the outpatient setting. Um, and there's actually even a capitation model within the program. There's a capitation option. And so we've been approached uh, to partner with uh, some of these direct contracting entities um, it's still early on. My, my experience has been that they tend to be startups that are leveraging uh, technology platforms versus human resources to manage patient care across a continuum. Um, and it's, it's really too early to comment on the clinician, clinician experience in this model. And actually just recently CMS indicated some significant changes to that direct contracting model. So much more to come on that one. So, um, you know, it, it's hard to cover any healthcare topic without, without addressing uh, the COVID pandemic. And I, the pandemic, I think, has forever changed perspectives and, and taught us important lessons about our healthcare system. You know, one of the interesting ones is the incredible shifts in volume in, in different healthcare settings that really expose a limitation of our fee-for-service model. So. You know, oftentimes it was the heroic frontline clinicians, especially in the emergency room, that we these are the people we were asking the most of during the pandemic, but they were also the ones that were most negatively impacted by episodic volume declines. You know, we we saw ED volume declines of up to 40%. Um, and, and in a volume-based market, in a volume-based model, that's, uh, you know, financially very challenging uh, for the clinician. As, as, and then as our hospitals filled, sometimes sometimes they filled with really low acuity COVID patients. And, and that meant we weren't able to accommodate some of the sickest patients. And so just like within BPCI, we had to redesign our care system on the fly to make sure that we were able to, that we were able to deliver the right care in the right place at the right time. Um, and telemedicine uh, was and is a big part of this. Um, and I'll speak about telemedicine on a later slide. And then in the midst of the pandemic, 
you know, we, we started, we were coming to terms as a nation with the issues we have around equity and social justice. And, and I think there's pretty good consensus that future payment models have to incentivize, incentivize and address equity and particularly address social determinants of health, uh, which I think is a, a really important component of, of future models. And then later in the pan pandemic, the nursing and staff shortages um, have, have really taught us that we have to prioritize the wellness and the resilience of our healthcare heroes. Uh, we, we have to take care of the people who are taking care of patients. Um, and, and we've learned a lot of important lessons uh, about what happens when we don't do that well, um, especially with our nursing colleagues. A big part of this is behavioral health. So we are, I think, at the same time seeing a spike in mental health issues and um, thankfully a lessening of the stigma attached to seeking help. And, and we have to meet this need and understand uh, that we can't have disparities in, in, in how we address mental health versus physical health. And then, and then the last thing I wanna to touch on is the impact of cost sharing. Um, Value-based care has traditionally been focused on creating value for government and private payers. But more and more as insurance companies put um, more of the burden on patients with high deductible plans, it's our patients that'll be the ones demanding value. And they'll be armed with increasing levels of pricing information. And, and so that's gonna be a big driver as well. So um, I, I've kind of alluded to this this uh, physician leadership model. And, and again, I, I may be biased, <laughs> um, but the advice I would offer to anyone looking to develop an effective approach to value-based care is, is to ensure that physicians are the cornerstone of your and, and right now, physicians are struggling with burnout and fatigue. And um, my experience is that value-based care is an excellent way to help connect them to purpose. And, and by, by prioritizing the best interest of patients, we can win their hearts. And, and when you win their hearts and engage them and enable them with the right data and support, um, patient outcomes will improve. And, and, and so I, I really think that's a key. With that, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Steve, you're on mute. Thanks, Roy. Um, yeah, I love that last slide. I, I totally agree with that. Um, we are at our second poll question. And so for the audience, we're curious, what is actually standing in your way of taking on or implementing value-based care? And so I'll go through these, but you know, lack of data, you just don't have the data to even take it on and, and understand what you can and can't do uh, or manage it. Um, the upside is just not enough, or same as before, downside, you just can't take that on. Um, there's just not enough pressure to change. Um, you, know, you know, the status quo is easy. Um, the next one would be just operationally or structurally, infrastructurally, uh, you're not able to take it on. Uh, the next one on the second column would be you've got competing priorities, it's just not going to make it. Um, uh, clinicians are just not there, they're not engaged. Or on the flip side, the hospital or health system uh, or administrators are not engaged. Or other, and if there is something other, just type it into the chat uh, within the platform and we can collate that too. So with that, I'm going to start the poll and we'll give it a, a little bit of time and then we'll look at the results. We'll give it another, let's say, 15, 15, 20 seconds.
Okay, looks like our polls are just starting to slow down. Let's see what we got. Okay, so, um, oh wow, so the majority, 57%, uh, just no data, um, which is fascinating to me. Uh, you know, it, what's fascinating to me, Rohit, like like these days, many of our meetings with prospects is actually about our analytics portion of the platform. Um, um, it is about the data. Um, upside incentives, only 16%. A big one was uh, just the financial risk for sure, 40%. Uh, no reason to change was sort of a minority item. Um, infrastructure operations, just not able to take it on was another big one, 40%. Um, competing priorities, 30, 28%. Uh, clinicians, just not there yet, 25%. The hospital not engaged, about 20%. And then some others. Uh, Laura, were there any interesting items in the others or that were manually typed in? Um, I, I actually am not able to see that. But I, let me see. Let me see if I can pull that forward. I didn't see anything. Okay. Nope. Okay. Okay. Cool. Uh, it's fascinating. And Rohit, any any thoughts or comments uh, before we move on? Well, I, I definitely um, can empathize with the lack of timely data. So, you know, claims data is really tough to work with, right? You get it so far uh, in, in arrears. And um, so you have to have a system that's able to create some leading and a link to that, those lagging indicators. And that's just really tough. Agreed. One of the well, statements, Steve, also was just time constraints when seeing patients to incorporate all of the known pieces that are required. Docs are, are overwhelmed. Yeah, I agreed. Um, yeah. Hopefully that changes as things now start to tamp down and we have a respite. Although not really because all the sick patient, patients are coming in now. Okay, uh, well, I, I know we're getting short on time, so I'm going to move us along, and uh, I'll go through quickly through this slide. So we put together a few tactical kind of basic strategies. Um, you know, taking on valuable care is way more complex than this, but this should get a lot of folks started or have some, you know, trigger some ideas if, uh, if you're not doing this. Uh, it is a little bit more acute and subacute focused, a little less focused on sort of pop health, um, you know, keeping patients healthy and and um, and kind of home-based um, uh, uh, focuses. But you know, I think we kind of said it. You've kind of heard throughout this. You know, it does start with great uh, physicians and aligned physicians. Um, you know, who are bought in on the goal. I think that's really important that we didn't put up on here. Um, two, uh, or number one, there was analytics actually, and and part of it is just you need to analyze your highest utilizers. So look at that particular cohort. And, and look for the commonalities. You know, they're using a lot of LTAX or SNFs, um, or they're just not getting PCP follow-up. Um, you know, what are the demographics that, that might be sort of a consistent theme? Uh, what are they getting admitted for? And then once you have that cohort, you can understand sort of where the waste is or where the overutilization is along that spectrum. So in the hospital, is it um, there are way too many inappropriate length of stays or readmissions are high or whatever um, and post acute you know wh what's being overutilized you know sniffs um, or high readmissions from certain locations um, in the home place is it you know how often are you getting direct to home discharges um, is there overutilization of home health you know at my organization there was um, and then once you once you have information, you can standardize things. I, I hate to say it, but sometimes if docs aren't educated, they'll shoot from the hip, um, and that can be wasteful um, with all the variation. And so now you can start to standardize clinical care paths. And you know, for example, in the hospital, you might standardize just making sure that admissions are truly admissions uh, based off of you know air quality to say or uh, when people come in, the docs begin to really follow care guidelines for, for how a, a AFib patient should be treated and what should happen. Um, uh, in the post-acute, it's partnering with your SNFs, looking at the ones that you, know, you wanna narrow in your network, home health, and, and so forth, same thing, just standardizing, educating, ensuring that there's a, a step, set 
way of when you can order home health and so forth. Um, narrowing the network, partnering with folks on value, very similar, but basically it's with your other providers, it's with your other specialists, cards, pulmonary, GI, surgery, all those guys, get with them, collaborate, um, you know, making sure timeliness evaluation, they do procedures in a timely fashion, availability, uh, partner with the pe pe places that your patients are going to um, and establish, you know, which ones you want to work with closely. And then you heard it time and time again here, incentivizing properly. Uh, with that, uh, back to you, Rohit. Perfect. Um, and I'll go a little bit deeper on those, actually. So so, so with any, any value-based care model, I think the biggest opportunity to reduce waste and, and will all, almost always be in acute and post-acute settings. And it's by ensuring that we're matching the intensity of service to the actual medical needs of the patient. And that's that's where our integration of multiple service lines can have a, a tremendous impact. So for example, for admitted patients, hospitalists collaborate with the hospital care team to ensure that we choose the least restrictive next site of care again, based on the clinical needs of the patient, so that we're not just sending patients uh, to, to skilled nursing facilities out of habit or um, some false sense of, of what, what that, how that's gonna benefit the patient. Um, we, we have competencies in building a continuum of care networks, which is part of that uh, on the last slide, narrowing your network. So working or, or partnering with a select group of home health and skilled nursing facilities and in in exchange for increased volume, these partners collaborate with us on providing high quality and efficient care. So these networks can allow us to create win-win relationships that really help overcontation and misalignment of incentives that are common across that transition. Um, and then we're fortunate to be to have the largest post-acute practice in the country. So uh, we have what we call SNFist um, that help us manage length of stay and quality in the SNF. Um, and their daily response prevent unnecessary ED visits and, and, and admissions. Uh, and then by creating connections between the SNF clinician and the ED physician, we can avoid unnecessary admissions. Even for those patients that need to be seen in an ED for a particular test, um, we can make it clear that, hey, we just need a CAT scan and if that's negative, you can send them back. Whereas <clears throat> most often, those, once, once those patients land in the ED because there's not that clinical integration, uh, they're going to get admitted. So I promised uh, to come back to telemedicine. And um, the rise of telemedicine may be, if, if we can call it that, the biggest silver lining of the pandemic. Um, and telemedicine can mean so many different things and can address different challenges within value-based care. So early on, we utilized telemedicine really to protect our clinicians from exposure and illness. Um, so seeing patients, they're in the hospital, but they're not going into the patient's room, um, instead managing by, by telemedicine. Later, we used telemedicine to provide additional capacity when we had local surges. So we could supplement the in-house team uh, by using telemedicine. We've also learned to monitor stable but at-risk patients by using remote patient monitoring, and that helps us conserve inpatient resources for the people who are, who are the most ill. Um, and then we're using ED follow-up telemedicine, uh, telemedicine to, to allow ED physicians to safely transition patients home who them, they might otherwise um, admit just for observation. So we're also engaging in the hospital at home model, which can deliver, you know, studies have shown can deliver equivalent outcomes and, and even at lower costs compared to facility-based care. So at this point, I think the ability of telemedicine to bend the cost curve actually um, remains more potential than reality, but the potential is certainly high. And, and I think we finally have broad acceptance of, of the modality, which we've never had in the past. John and emphasize is just the importance of technology and data. And that, that came out of our, our poll question as well. Um, the more we can advance and integrate technology, um, the more we can support our clinicians in delivering high value care. Um, and this definitely leverage Ingenious Med. 
So IAM gives us a, a common platform to overcome the lack of consistent EMRs between facilities. Uh, it allows ag patients. It allows us to generate data and analytics at the individual clinician level. And then a big piece of it, it allows clinicians to communicate and hand off key clinical information. Um, so having that platform is, is really key to solving some of the, the, the technological and, and data challenges that are common when you're trying to tackle value-based care. And Steve, I'll hand it back to you. Okay, yeah, thank you, Rohit. Um, I'm not gonna go over this slide uh, just in the interest of time because I want to get to as many questions as we can, but these are things that IM does and, and you know, given there's an analytics theme here, uh, that last column there is we're heavy, heavy on analytics to run the business and, and help uh, support sort of contracts and all that sort of stuff. So with that, um, I saw one question and yes, this um, that is definitely a metaphor for healthcare with the backwards typewriter. Uh, um, um, compared to a computer uh, is where we need to be going. Um, it is slow. Uh, Laura, were there other questions in the uh, Yeah, in the so chat? first I want to address, I got several questions. Uh, the presentation and the webinar recording will both be provided following up and be sent out to everyone. So that was a popular question I was getting. So just wanted to address that right up front. And then let's get into some of the questions here on the presentation. So BPCI Advanced versus Classic, what is the difference in the delta between the two? This might have been addressed somewhat, but can you address that one more time? Yeah, so BPCI Classic um, uh, was a three-year program, and after it ended, uh, CMMI introduced BPCI Advanced. Uh, and and the, probably the two biggest changes is one, in BPCI Classic, the target, your target price was 2%. Uh, Medicare took the first 2% in savings, right? So you could share in savings beyond that. That 2% went to 3% in, in BPCI Advanced. Um, and then the other big change they that they added was target prices are being adjusted um, based on uh, cohorts of hospitals. Um, and, and, and so there's, Whereas in BPCI Classic, there were fixed and finite target prices. It's it's more of a moving target in BPCI Advanced, so it makes it a little less predictable. Okay, thank you. We had a couple questions around private equity. These are a little tough, but let's see if we can get some answers on these. So, what impact do you see private equity playing in some of the growth trends? And then this other one was somewhat related, and it said, do you think private equity in the long run is going to be positive or negative as they continue to apply pressure to turn profits? Fascinating. It's a, it's a good question, huh? Um, yeah. I mean, private equity is about the numbers. Um, that could be a good thing. It could be a bad thing. I think it could provide the pressure to force change for organizations um, to you know, take on things and, and be more aggressive. You know, you you know, the status quo is not good enough. Um, it is also, you know, you might get into the actuarial focus and the, you know, the numbers focus as opposed to sort of the heart focus, which is a huge part of doing well with this, right? In terms of, you know, involving the clinician. So I don't know, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. Yeah. And I don't know if it's clear. So Steve, I'll, I'll share my thoughts and I think you know, the label private equity uh, gets thrown out a lot. Um, and, and I think it's it's not about private equity or venture capital or anything else. It's really about the specific organization you're referring to. So we know that there are venture capitalists, private equity firms that will, you know, go will acquire a, a, a healthcare organization, strip out resources, and then, you know, turn it for a profit. And I think that's very harmful for for the industry, it, it's a bad model. There's many private equity um, organizations that actually just provide support and capital that's needed, especially when you need to make investments in a, in a value-based program. And, and you need to make investments before you really have a return on those investments. So I, I think it can be helpful to some organizations. I can tell you Team Health is owned actually by private equity. And um, in our organization, it's been, uh, all positive. 
You know, for example, during COVID, when our volumes went down 40%, our clinicians didn't get a 40% pay cut uh, because we had a private equity partner that was that was able to bankroll us. Uh, and so um, it, it can be very helpful. If we, if, you know, if we were still publicly traded, there's nothing, there would have been no other option other than to, to cut clinician pay. And so I just think it depends on the specific, uh, you know, entity that you're looking at. Yeah, it's, it's who you got married to. It really depends. I, I agree yeah. with that. Well, Laura, thank you questions? both so, so much for your presentation. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but for all those unanswered questions, um, we do have them all and we have all your contact information and we will be able to reach out with those answers. Um, I just want to thank you both again for your excellent presentation and also thank Ingenious Med for sponsoring today's webinar. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day and we really look forward to having you join us for future webinars. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Rohit. Thanks.